Hello and welcome back to Crystallography for Everyone. In this video, I'm going to go through some more examples of how we calculate Miller indices for crystal planes. Specifically, we're going to look inside of the unit cell. In the last video, we quantified the faces of our crystal. We saw the one, zero, zero face denoting this face, and we saw the one bar zero face, denoting this back face of the crystal. We saw how convention dictates that both of these have parentheses around them. And we looked at all the other ones. If you haven't watched that last video, I highly suggest you go back to it because I think in this video we're going to move fairly quickly and try to see as many of these planes as possible. They aren't particularly difficult, but there are some strange cases that can show up, so I'm going to just try and go through as many as I can. I think I'll start off with a fairly important plane. This would be the Well, we'll 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 see. I guess I, I was about to say the answer, but this plane intercepts x at one, y at one, and z at one, and I'll I'll shade it in again. And we we can immediately see why we want to use Miller indices here. What would we call this face without Miller indices? We could. I guess call it the diagonal face, but that would not be very descriptive. I think that you could make an argument that saying this is the diagonal face would describe a lot of the different faces of this crystal. So we have intercepts. We'll just follow the same procedure as before. We have intercepts at x, y, and z equals 1. And the reciprocal of these gives us, again, 1, 1, and 1. And since we don't have any fractions, we can directly write down the Miller index. This plane, and I'll change colors, this plane is denoted as the 1, 1, 1 plane. Almost anyone working in any sort of physics or engineering where you're dealing with crystals would immediately call this the 1, 1, 1 plane. And if you were, for example, working with them, you, you would just be expected to know immediately what this plane is. It's a fairly important plane that comes up in a lot of examples, and we will definitely see it again. So I will erase and draw another plane. How about this plane? So this is another plane that if we were to simply try and describe the planes, you could also, I think, say this would be a, the diagonal plane. So I think this problem is becoming extremely evident. So I'll shade in this plane again and go through our procedure as before. So this plane intercepts x at See, I'll change colors here. Intercepts x at 1, y at 1, and it just extends off into z. So we say that intercepts z at infinity. So we have 1, 1, and infinity. We can take reciprocals. We get 1, 1, and 0. And then the Miller index 
we know is 1, 1, 0. So this plane is the 1, 1, 0 plane. I think it's becoming evident that it was a good idea to call the edges of our cube as 1 to, a, to define our axes like that because it's pretty easy to get the index of all of these planes that intercept at the edges or corners of the cube. Each time we're taking reciprocals here, we don't have to clear any fractions. But if we start working inside of the cube, we will have some fractions to clear. So how about we do this plane? I'll just draw this in here and I will shade it once again. I think this is where you can really see that shading comes in handy. If you're drawing these yourself, I highly suggest that you practice doing some cross hatching to really visualize where that plane is in space. We can follow the same procedure for this plane as any other plane. We see that it, like the 001 plane, if you remember the 001 plane from the last video, this plane does not intercept at x or y. So we'll say that intercepts at infinity, which is our cheating way of saying it doesn't intercept. And it intercepts the z-axis. It intercepts the z-axis at one half. At one half. So we can take reciprocals again and get zero, zero, and two. We can write down the Miller index for this plane as zero, zero, two. So this is the zero, zero, two plane, which bisects the middle of this cube and you can see there's a, a much more efficient way of describing this cube. So I could say this plane bisects the middle of the cube running parallel to the xy plane, perpendicular to the z axis. That wouldn't be a very efficient way of describing this plane. And if we had to describe multiple planes, that could get really confusing. It's very easy to just say this is the zero, zero, 002 plane, and if everyone has learned how to deal with their Miller indices, they will immediately recognize which plane we are describing. In the next video, I'm going to go through even more examples of Miller indices. I think that you can tell that I believe these are really important in crystallography going to go through some more complicated examples and I'm going to really do my best to equip you to look at any plane that you come across and be able to index it. I hope to see you there.